and start broadcast. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Darcy Belito de Luna with the AIUM, and I will be your host today. As part of our continuing education for healthcare professionals, I am pleased to host this webinar on ultrasonography in low resource settings with a focus on the COVID-19 virus, presented by Dr. Kwaku Defour Depa. Today's webinar will discuss ultrasound challenges in low resource areas, which are further complicated by COVID-19 infections and how practitioners in these regions can help reduce the spread of COVID-19. For more information about this webinar, please visit the webinar listing in the AIUM Education Center on our website. If you have questions for the presenter during this webinar, you may type them into the question, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering questions until after he has completed his presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'd like to present Dr. Kwaku de Ford de Pa. Thank you very much, Darcy, for the introduction. My name is Kweku Dufordapa. Um, I work in the Kolibu Teaching Hospital in Accra, Ghana. This afternoon, I'm going to go through the topic COVID-19, ultrasonography in low resource settings, working with less. Now, at the end of this session, it's anticipated that all participants will be able to understand the challenges practitioners in low resource countries face whilst they perform ultrasounds on a daily basis. Participants should be able to recognize how these challenges are complicated by the surge in COVID-19 infections in these low resource countries. Again, we expect that participants will be able to describe how practitioners in low resource countries can make the best out of the little they have to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 during ultrasonography. Now what's the picture like? We've heard so much about COVID-19, but I would like us to focus a bit on health workers. As of the 23rd of July, 2020, uh, records indicated that over 10,000 healthcare workers were infected in According to the International Council of Nurses, over 90,000 health workers have been infected worldwide. Um, from our data in Ghana, as of the 17th of July, 2020, we had over 2,000 healthcare workers infected in Ghana. And unfortunately, six deaths have occurred. This is just to highlight the fact that health workers are at extreme risk of getting infected with COVID. And these are the figures we have uh, presently. Now in my hospital, which is a Kolibu teaching hospital in Accra, Ghana, we performed, as of the 5th of August, we had performed about 3,569 tests. And of these tests, 33% were patients and 67% were tests done on staff. I'm talking about COVID-19 tests on staff. Now, of the staff we tested, 13.2% of them had tested, uh, tested positive. And of this number, 10% were doctors and 4% uh, were radiographers. So this is just bringing it down to the fact that in ultrasonography, we do have people who are um, our health staff who are working in this, uh, this field also getting infected. Now, this is a situation reports, the weekly cases of COVID-19 in the regions of the world. Now, if you look at the America scene, Americas have the highest um, case reports, I mean, high, highest number of cases. Africa, Southeast Asia seem not to have too many cases compared to the other regions of the world. Now, for the weekly deaths, the picture is just about the same. Africa, Southeast Asia, 
and the West Pacific don't have too many uh, deaths relatively. Now this is data I have from Ghana. We've tested a total of about 42,000 people. And this was as of the 13th of, uh, I mean, as of the 13th of August, we had about 42,000 of uh, people testing positive and 231 deaths have occurred. So we still have the virus causing a lot of havoc. Now this data is um, a representation of the, another representation of the one I posted earlier. Now other countries with low resources also have significant, um, are experiencing significant effects of the virus. Now Kenya, as at 18th of August from data available on the um, WHO website indicate that the number of confirmed cases were about 30,000 with 487 deaths. Now Brazil also seems to have 3.41 million confirmed cases with 110,000 deaths. And that appears to be a rise from what the data was previously. Now COVID-19, a brief, something briefly on COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 is caused by the novel coronavirus, also known as SARS-CoV-2. And again, we know that it was identified in Wuhan in China in 2019. Now, after the virus was discovered, people started getting infected. There was a major spread. Eventually, the WHO declared it as a public health emergency, and this was in January 2020. Subsequently, countries started getting, they started trying to do something to control the effect of COVID-19. Countries started closing their borders, measures were put in place to control the effect of COVID-19 to limit its spread. Unfortunately, we seemed to lag a bit behind the virus and as of March 2020, the disease had been declared a pandemic. In Ghana here, we discovered our first uh, two cases in early March. And subsequently, we've had a rise, a significant rise in the number of infections to the extent that now we have significant community spread, just like virtually every other place in the world. For transmission, we know that the main means of transmission is by person-to-person -person contact. And that is how the disease is transmitted primarily. And this should occur if there is close contact and mainly through respiratory droplets. Now we know that the virus can survive on different surfaces for varying periods of time and transmission can also occur through uh, such contaminated surfaces. One factor or one condition which is still up for debate is airborne transmission. There's still a lot of debate about it. It's still a very controversial issue and that is yet to be decided on. But some consider airborne transmission as a means of transmission of COVID-19. Now, it is known, this is what we know about the virus as of today. It is known that infected persons usually will be more infect, uh, infectious at the early stages of their infection. And for people who have mild to moderate disease, they are less likely to be infectious after up to 10 days of, ex uh, of the time they exhibit their symptoms. And for those who have severe infections, they are thought to be infectious up to about 20 days of the time they start showing uh, symptoms. Now to reduce infection, we keep saying that we should do a number of things. We should we've, we've put a number of measures in place to help reduce the risk of infection. Putting on a mask in public, hand hygiene, and for hand hygiene, it's either with rubbing alcohol between 60 and 95% and washing um, with soap and water. Respiratory hygiene, so that people are expected to cover their mouths and noses when they are coughing. 
I already mentioned masks, and we have various types of masks which are available for use. And depending on your risk level, there are different kinds of masks that you should be using. We encourage people to avoid crowds, and that was one of the bases upon which countries and states and communities were shut down. And the other thing is to avoid close contact with infect infected persons. That's if you get to know who is infectious, who is infected, because we now know that people may be infected but would be asymptomatic. So if you get to know who is infected, yes, you have to avoid close contact with infected persons, but that is a bit difficult. Now, social distancing is also one of the significant measures that have been proposed, and it seems to do so much in helping reduce the risk of spread of the infection. Now, let's zone into low resource or low resource settings in ultrasonography. If you have a situation where an individual uh, society is unable to uh, cater for the healthcare costs because of lack of funds, you have several things which also come into effect. Now, if this occurs in the present uh, and it leads to limited access to medication, equipment supplies, devices, um, if there is less developed infrastructure as a result of this limitation in funds, and you can understand why there will be less development of infrastructure. If funds are limited, there wouldn't be enough to do uh, to develop other uh, sectors. If there are fewer or less trained personnel, or there's limited access to uh, maintenance, uh, to funds for maintenance and other parts of equipment, or if there's limited availability of equipment, supplies, and medication, then we can categorize such a society or such an individual as being, in, as being a low resource society or low resource setting. Now in low resource settings, by virtue of the fact that there, there is inadequate access to funds for doing what needs to be done, there are several challenges that come into play. Now in direct relation to COVID, some of the things or some of the factors that have come up are our difficulties in testing for COVID, the waiting time for our test results, and the availability of uh, personal protective equipment, challenges with trained personnel who are supposed to perform uh, ultrasounds for us, and that results in a, a very low patient sonographer uh, ratio. I mean, a very high patient sonographer ratio availability of high resolution ultrasound equipment and of course old equipment. Now these are factors which a lot of these factors predated COVID-19 but their existence in low resource settings and the emergence of COVID-19 have actually even complicated the situation even the more. Now when COVID was uh, discovered or diagnosed we had to develop a lot of tests. Uh, we have to bring, uh, get centers to be testing the people who get infected. Unfortunately, in low resource centers, because of the capital needed to work on the development of these centers, and because of the capital, uh, the financial resources involved in procuring test equipment, the, I mean, the test kits, it's, the, these things are not readily available. And as a result, we have fewer test centers because of the low resources. There are longer waiting periods because people, uh, the lab reports tend to get piled up because there are more people who need to be tested and fewer resources to take care of these things. And as a result of this, especially in a hospital setting, it has an adverse effect on the number of uh, personal protective equipment we end up using. For example, if you have to wait for, say, two weeks to get a result, your results from a COVID test. What it means is that we would assume that the person or the patient we are testing is positive until the results come. And once the person is positive, it means that we'll have to go in all the personal protective equipment required when taking care of a patient who has COVID-19. And this puts a lot of strain on resources. And as a result of this strain on 
resources, we eventually get shortages earlier than we should be getting the shortages in equipment. Now, based on WHO modeling, the equipment required, the uh, personal protective equipment required per month worldwide is estimated at around 89 million masks for, uh, around 89 million uh, for masks, 76 million gloves, and about just under 2 million uh, goggles. Now, there, there is a rising demand for these personal protective equipment. And when the disease came up, people started panic. There was a panic uh, buying of these equipment because people were afraid and did not know how things were going to end. Others took advantage of this whole situation and started hoarding the equipment. And this ended up increasing the prices of the equipment as a result of the artificial shortage that had been created. Again, another problem for low resource settings where if equipments are expensive, people would not be able to afford them. Now, we know that our health workers rely on personal protective equipment to protect themselves and, of course, the patients. And with all the factors above, we've had our health workers being put at an increased risk for uh, the, getting the infection from uh, getting infection from the patients and transmitting the infection to the patients if they are tested positive. Now, in 2012, Lagrone et al. reviewed the training opportunities for ultrasonography in low and middle income countries. And the findings suggested that in most of the low resource countries we have, uh, there are just a few or virtually no radiograph uh, radiologists to perform the ultrasounds that need to be, to be performed. Most of these ultrasounds are performed by uh, generalists, uh, obstetric physicians. In fact, in some cases, they found out that there were people who were not even medical personnel who were performing ultrasounds. Again, this, they, are, they are steady found out that a, a number or a significant number of the training programs did not meet the WHO criteria in terms of the duration of the training required, the content of training, as well as the quality of the products of these training programs. They, however, discovered that there were a few programs which actually had excellent outcomes, despite the challenges that were up there. Now, data available to us from the WHO indicates that 60% of the world has no access to radiological services at all, and that's a very huge number. And this, they actually confirmed the, the studies by Legron, which indicated that most of the ultrasounds were not being done by radiologists or even by trained personnel. Now, the WHO again indicates that 6.9% of women in rural areas have access to ultrasound. That's just six under 10%. And in urban areas, you have just about 30% of women having access. That is not acceptable. Now, in a study by Aman, they tried to, uh, Aman et al., they tried to uh, assess the experience and views of uh, doctors on the use of ultrasound. And this was done, this was a study done in Tanzania. And one of their key findings was that there was lack of ultrasound equipment and even staff to conduct the examinations that were required. And this they found to be a significant factor in which a significant factor which affected the ability to diagnose and manage some cases appropriately, especially in the cases of pregnant women. And of course, we know the significant effect of our inability to care for pregnant women on their mortalities. This, to some extent, may account for 
some of the high mortalities we are having amongst our women in low resource countries. Now, apart from these challenges, a number of the equipment in some of the low resource countries have, are, are very old and they are obsolete. Uh, the number of the machines are old and obsolete. Sometimes their picture quality is so bad that you can't really make any meaningful thing out of what you'll be seeing on ultrasound. Again, we know that there is a challenge with adequate power supply to the extent that the amount of power generated by Sub-Saharan, the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa is just about the same as is being generated by Spain, a single country. And even with this amount of power generated, a significant portion, that's just over a quarter of this, is um, unavailable. And because it is unavailable, it has an effect on the functioning of equipment and other devices. Now, one in five people have access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa. And therefore, if you don't have an equipment which can run on a battery, then it means that the women in such regions with the very low access would not be able to have ultrasound services. There is a lack of servicing for these machines because of uh, several factors. One being that there may not be a service uh, personnel who can service the equipment in the region where these machines are available or because there's just a poor maintenance culture. Now, why would somebody who is performing an ultrasound be worried about COVID? That's the question. Why would somebody who's worried about, who is performing an ultrasound be worried about COVID? Now, there are challenges. Whenever we are performing an ultrasound scan, we sit very close to the patient. And therefore, our two, uh, two arm length limit is breached virtually all the time. We sit as close sometimes as a foot or even less from the patient. And therefore, it means that our contact, patient, our contact with the patient is, put, is, is too close. Now, this negates our ability to even have any form of social uh, distancing. Ultrasound rooms generally in low resource settings are quite small and may not have adequate ventilation. And as a result of this, again, the risk is increased. If we were to perform ultrasound scans in short periods, we may at least be mitigating the risk to some extent. But with the kind of equipment that are available and the kind of studies that are that, are, that need to be done, we end up spending long periods of time doing the ultrasound examination for the patient. And this again increases the risk of the sonographer, as well as increasing the risk of the patient, especially if either one of these people is positive for the virus. Sometimes when we are performing an ultrasound, we ask the patient to inhale and exhale or we ask the patient to cough. And these increase our risks, especially if the patient is positive and has not, uh, is not wearing a mask, especially. Whilst performing ultrasounds, we tend to touch the probes, we tend to touch the screen, we tend to touch the, um, the surfaces of the keyboard a lot. And if there is any infection present, we have the risk of transferring it from ourselves to the machines and to the patients. Now, we, it is important that we reduce the risk of the infections whilst performing ultrasounds. But in addition to the, those factors I, I listed, there are other things which increase the risk of people, uh, of, of uh, staff increase the risk of staff. And some of these include inadequate training or inefficient um, infection prevention training, especially for respiratory pathogens, including COVID-19. 
And this may happen because resources to organize such trainings may be limited. In a few instances, the staff themselves may not be adhering to the measures optimally. And therefore they put them, the, the staff themselves, as well as other patients at risk of getting uh, infected from COVID-19. Now, once measures are put in place to reduce infection, it's important that supervision is intensified. This is not always the case. And therefore, inadequate supervision uh, or monitoring and enforcement of the measures to reduce infection may not be optimal. And this also increases the risk of infections. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, because of the large numbers, it may be difficult to strictly adhere to social and physical distancing at work. And this increases our risk of getting an infection from the patient or from ourselves as staff. Now, how do we reduce the risk of transmission during ultrasonography? And this is the main reason why we are having this discussion. We know that there are standard precautions that are uh, available for prevention of infection in all settings. Now, even though we need to ensure that all these things, these precautions are, are implemented strictly according to the way they are supposed to be implemented, we do have instances where there are significant resource challenges. And in the presence of such significant resource challenges, we must be able to still prevent the spread of infections whilst not significantly um, reduce it. We, we need to reduce or we, we need to be able to adapt and reduce the spread of infections whilst not compromising on safety. Now to mitigate the risk, we can look at the measures in terms of those which, are, which involve PPEs, personal protective equipment, and those which don't involve the use of personal protective equipment. Now for the factors which don't involve the use of personal protective equipment, let's talk about prioritizing ultrasounds. Now we know that there are some ultrasounds that are not so urgent, there are others that are very urgent. Now these ultrasound scans requests need to be prioritized such that we are only doing those which are very necessary that, and those that need to be done. Now in making such decisions, we must also be careful not to create a situation where we have patients who really need, who really need ultrasounds done urgently and then they end up not getting it done because we didn't do our risk assessment and our triaging appropriately. If the, there's a way, we, we, we have to do this so that we individualize the patients and study their individual situations on a case by case basis. So that ultrasounds that are not really urgent can be and can be deferred, they should just definitely be deferred. A lot of institutions have instituted measures at the entry points to the hospitals. And for us in our hospital, we have several of these, point, uh, these screening points at the entry, entry points of, our, of the various units. Now, we need to have staff, relatives of patients or the accompanying persons, as well as the patients themselves screened at the entry points. So once they arrive at the facility, there should be some screening done. Now, in screening the patients, there are various measures that have been employed. Some screen by just uh, taking a travel history, looking out for contacts, check for symptoms, and others also add the temperature checks. Now, once you do all these things, if any patient or staff or a patient's accompanying, accompanying person is suspicious for COVID-19, it's expected that such patients will be sent to a holding area where further interrogation and action will be taken. Now, there's, 
most of these or a number of these things are not very capital intensive unless of course we have to uh, unless we, we have challenges with other um, resources and in which case we may have to spend uh, we may have to redistribute our staff and therefore it may eventually get expensive in the long run now once we've screened our patients and we've discovered that they are not suspicious for COVID-19 and the patients get into our holding areas, uh, our waiting rooms for a scan to be done. It's important that we still maintain the physical distancing, social distancing protocols. Now, the easiest thing to do is to minimize the number of patients we are getting or patient, number of patients who will be getting to sit in our waiting rooms. In some cases, we, uh, for example, in, in, in our center, we actually have an open air area where the patients can actually sit and they, they get to be called in tents to come into the area so that they get their scans done. And this is, of course, after we've triaged them and found out which need to be done and which need not be done. And in doing all these things, we should remember that we are trying to maintain some social distancing. If it is possible and the patient coming for the scan can do without an accompanying person, then it's, it's, it's desirable to limit the presence of other of accompanying persons. Unless of course there, there is a language barrier or there is a challenge which would require the presence of an accompanying person. But we should try to minimize this as much as possible so we reduce the number of people who come into the ultrasound room. Trainees, at this point where the, we are battling with the disease, um, it's, it's suggested that we allow trainees to stay away for some time unless it becomes absolutely necessary that they come into the scanning area. And even when they come, we should make, make sure that we do things such that their health and the health of the patient and the sonographer are still protected. The other thing which is important and which may sometimes be overlooked is the ventilation of the ultrasound, ventilation of the ultrasound room. Now we know that our ultrasound systems need efficient cooling and ventilation in order to be effective. Now, most of the centers have air conditioned systems which help in cooling these equipment. And it's important that we maintain a very well ventilated examination room. There are challenges with functioning of some of these equipment, especially in our hot climates. And this may result in an increase in temperature and may even cause our equipment to more function. Ideally, if there was a way of working without using the ultrasound, without using the air conditioners, it would have been appropriate. So I would use natural air instead of using the air conditioner. But this isn't always uh, an easy thing to do, especially because of the way some of our ultrasound rooms have already been built. Now, the other challenge is that a lot of the hospital systems are not equipped with the high efficiency particulates air filters. And therefore, the uh, filtration of the suspended uh, particles, viral particles, if they, are available, if they are in the environment, may be a bit of a challenge. Now, the WHO has recommended that if it is possible to turn off air conditioners and open windows for adequate air to flow in for good ventilation, if it is possible, and if that is feasible, then it is something that should be encouraged. That is if it is feasible. But unfortunately, some of the rooms have already been built in such a way that this may not be something that can be done. Now to reduce the risks that are involved in, I mean, the risk involved, we have to 
minimize contacts of our staff who have um, conditions that increase their risk. We, try, we have to minimize the contact of these, of these staff with patients or we minimize the risk of their contact in environments which are high risk areas. Now, there are a number of conditions which at this point are known to increase the risk of people getting uh, severe disease. Now, we know that cancers, um, pulmonary diseases, immunocompromised state, serious heart conditions, sickle cell disease, type 2 diabetes, as well as several other conditions, increase the risk of people, I mean, the risk of severe disease in our staff and patients. So especially for staff who have some of these risks, we have to be careful in how we assign them to duties, especially in an ultrasound room or in other high risk areas. Now, we also know that the risk of severe disease increases with increasing age. And the risk appear to, appears to be highest for patients who are over the age of, for persons who are over the age of 85. And therefore, if we have staff who are elderly, if possible, we should let them stay away. And that's, that's what we did in our center. We asked our staff who are the older staff to stay away at least for some time, whilst we try to get control over the situation. Now this table or this graph looks at the risk of severe of um, hospitalization. And as was said earlier, the risk is highest for those who are over the age of 35, of 85 and lowest for younger age groups. Now hand hygiene. One major challenge that we may have, we may have because of our low, of our problems with resources is the availability of water, or just the constant availability of water for maintaining hand hygiene. Now, difficult as it may seem, hand hygiene significantly reduces the risk of transmission of the infection of COVID-19. And therefore, even though it may be a challenge because of our limitations in terms of risk, hospitals and systems must invest in the supply of water for their staff. But then apart from just using water and soap for hand hygiene, alcohol-based hand wraps using 60 to 90% alcohol is also um, recommended. In fact, it is, uh, it is um, useful in cases where your, the hands are not visibly soiled and it improves compliance so that people don't have to get up, go out to some other place, wash their hands for long periods and come back to see another patient. So if hands are not visibly soiled, then alcohol-based hand wraps can be used uh, safely by our staff. Now, when we are doing our hand washing, it should be at least for 20 seconds. And we should be doing the hand hygiene before and after interacting with any patient during the ultrasonography, before and after. Now, I've already indicated that the alcohol-based hand wraps are very useful. Compliance is better. And again, local production is also very possible. In fact, in our country, several companies emerged when the need for alcohol-based hand wraps arose, and they've significantly produced a lot to take care of the needs of the communities. Now, those were the non-PPE uh, factors. But let's look at the PPE, the factors that are based on the use of P uh, personal pr protection equipment. So we'll, we are looking at masks, gowns, gloves, aprons, face shields, and goggles. A lot of the procedures we do do not involve aerosol, are not aerosol uh, generating procedures. And in such cases, 
our regular surgical masks are recommended. Now, relatively, the surgical masks are lower priced. So for non, uh, for, for non aerosol generating procedures, surgical masks can be used. But in cases where we are going to generate aerosols, or we suspect that there will be um, the, the procedure may result in the generation of aerosols, then N95 filtering face piece respirators, the FFRs, are recommended. Now, if you look at this image, it indicates that once we have people not wearing face masks, there is an increased risk of transmission of infection between these two people. Now, once a mask is worn, the risk of transmission is reduced to, to, some, to some extent. If both people involved wear masks, then we have a significant reduction in the risk of um, transmission of an infection. And therefore, it is obvious from this point that when you wear masks, you actually protect the person next to you. So the protection is for the other person, um, the other person involved. Now, because of the risk of infections, I mean, the risk of transmission of infections and the limitation in supply of face masks, because of resource challenges, it's important to optimize the supply of our N95 FFRs. And in optimizing the supplies, there are several strategies that can be used. Now, we use the conventional strategy when we are using our, our face masks on an every, like we use them every day for everyday use. Now we use the con uh, contingency strategies when we expect that there should be there will be some shortages, and once we know that there are shortages, then we have to uh, use the crisis strategy. Now for contingency strategies, um, we usually use the extent we use the extended use um, strategy. Now for extended use, it means that we are using our N95 FFRs for prolonged periods. And we use them for several patients. Now after using them for a number of patients, we just take them off and discard them. Now this is one way of using the, of increasing the lifespan of our face masks in cases where there are challenges with uh, resources or you are anticipate that there will be challenges. Otherwise, they will just be used for one patient and then discard it or they'll be used according to their manufacturer's recommendations. But if you are using the contingency strategy, then it means that we are using them beyond the um, designated shelf life prescribed by the manufacturer. Now, as I said earlier, in cases where we know that there's shortage of supply of these equipment, we have to use the crisis capacity strategies. And a lot of uh, countries or a lot of low resource countries are perpetually in their crisis capacity mode. Now, in the crisis capacity mode, the respirators which are available, the N95s which are available, as well as the other types of respirators, the KN95 and all the others, are used beyond the manufacturer designated shelf life for healthcare and delivery. So that one, we don't use the respirators for just one patient. We don't just use them for a number of patients and this, a number of patients discard them at the end of the day. We go a step further and may even have to use the respirators, keep them and then use them again later for other patients. Now we can have what we call the limited reuse where the N95 FFR is worn for one patient. You then uh, store it before you use it for another uh, patient for a limited number of use. And of course, 
we'll be looking at the kind of procedure or kind of uh, whatever you are, you are, whichever patient you are scanning. You look at the characteristics of the patient and the infection risk before using your FFRs. And of course, you have to also decontaminate the N95s. And this is also part of the limited reuse strategy. We've already spoken about the extended reuse strategy where you use it for several patients without taking it off. Now we know that once you use the respirator for prolonged periods, it doesn't get as, it's, it's not as fit as it was when you started using it. And there are factors which would limit its reuse. Now, these factors would include determining whether the, the uh, face, the respirator, the FFR has a good fit, whether the filtration performance is also good, whether it's contaminated or whether there's been soil, uh, soiling or whether there's been any damage at all. Now, if your uh, mask is damaged, obviously you can't reuse it because then you would not be providing yourself with any significant protection. Now, in cases where there are limitations in resources, as we have in our low resource uh, countries, getting the kind of, uh, of uh, respirator, which can be used several times, is actually going to be very beneficial. Now, there is this reusable respirator, which um, allows you to use your surgical mask up to about six times. So you can cut out sections of the, you can divide your surgical mask into several pieces, and these ones will be fitted into the respirator. It has an effective seal, and you can use this for long periods. So that you, you increase your, the life cycle, or just the lifespan of your face mask by six. You just use a small piece of the face mask at a time. So for example, if you're going to use your, your single face mask, under normal circumstances for just a day, then it means now you can use it for six days with the reusable respirator. Now, gowns. We need, we need to perform, uh, wear our gowns when we are performing an aerosol generating procedure. And therefore, if we are doing an ultrasound procedure and we don't anticipate the generation of any aerosol, then we can do without the ultrasound that we can do without the gowns, sorry. Again, if we are, we are scanning a patient who is a suspected, probable, or confirmed COVID-19 case, then we need to wear our gowns. Now, because we know that some, uh, we know that patients may be positive and still be asymptomatic. If we have a patient who has a positive travel history or there's been a positive com uh, contact, then we should assume that this patient is probably positive for COVID-19 and therefore the gowns need to be worn. We are assuming that the patient is, uh, is COVID-19 positive. So whenever we are performing a procedure on such a patient, even if it's not an aerosol generating procedure, we need to wear our disposable gowns. Now disposable gloves are necessary. They are necessary because for starters, even in the absence of ultrasonography, uh, in the absence of COVID, the gel and a lot of the things we do during ultrasounds can get quite messy. So it is appropriate that we wear our gowns, uh, we wear our gloves. And a single, uh, a single pair of gloves can be used if you are doing a normal, you are doing a scan for a normal, uh, a patient who, who you don't suspect has COVID. But if you have a suspected, probable, or confirmed case, then you need two pairs of gowns, uh, two pairs of gloves, disposable gloves for your protection. Now, how about our eye protection and cover? Now, we need to have our uh, goggles and we also need to have our eye covers when we are scanning patients who are suspected, probable, or confirmed for COVID-19. And therefore, if we don't think that the patient has COVID-19 or the patient is not a suspected case, 
than we can actually do without our eye pro, our, our, uh, the eye protection or the head cover. Now, how about bed covering? Traditionally, a lot of centers use linen, reusable linen for the care of their patients when they are performing ultrasounds. And the reusable linen needs to be washed and taken through several processes before it can be reused. Now this may put a bit of a toll on centers which don't have the resources. And therefore there are tissue rolls, very long tissue rolls which are disposable and can be used for the patient. Now, once each patient comes in, they get their disposable tissue roll, which is spread over the bed that is to be used. And after it's used, this, after the patient has used it and has left, this can be taken off and another patient will come in and use a different one. So this is a cheaper alternative to reusable linen. There is no need to wash or to do any decontamination. So like, there's no need for all those things to be done. Now this is an image of uh, an example of the disposable roll. Now this is taken off at this level once this patient is done with the scanning and another long sheet is rolled onto the bed for the patient to use so that you don't need to replace this one. You can use the linen here until it gets soiled or you can change it intermittently after a number of patients have used it and this will reduce the, the costs. Now for the cleaning of the equipment it just has to be done according to the recommendations by the manufacturer and you should remember that if you, if you use an inappropriate, material, uh, inappropriate cleaning agent or use an inappropriate uh, concentration of agents. You may damage your equipment and if there's a warranty on your equipment, you may, um, you, you may not have your equipment valid again to assess your warranty. You void the warranty. In cases where the transducer gets soiled, you can use soap and water to remove blood stains and um, you, you can air dry it or you can use a soft cloth to dry it to prevent corrosion of the transducers. And of course, after each use of the, trans, of the transducer, it needs to be cleaned as per the specification of the manufacturer. Now, because we know that the COVID, the virus can stay on various surfaces for various this, it's important that we recognize the duration over which the, the virus is going to be uh, viable and therefore clean our equipment appropriately. So for our um, ultrasound equipment, depending on what it is made up, made up of, we should just look at the um, duration over which it is, over which the virus can survive on it and clean appropriately. And we know that if we don't clean well, we can, for example, have the virus stay on the plastic from which our ultrasound equipment is made from for about five days. And that increases the risk of the provider as well as the patient on the, on the, the patient who is receiving the scan. Now, this is just the same one that we spoke about. Now, in times when the a patient needs to be scanned and a patient is a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 case, things need to be done slightly different. Now, in our settings where we don't have too many ultrasound equipment and therefore can't dedicate a single machine in most cases just to scan COVID cases, then we may have to adapt other measures. Now, it is ideal to scan patients who are positive for COVID or are suspected as the last case for the day so that you can use your equipment for whatever you would have to use it for. But then your COVID case is the last case for the day. You scan the COVID patient and then that's it for the day. So the machine then gets cleaned 
in the way it is supposed to be cleaned. And you know that um, it wouldn't disturb the flow of patients, at least for the period. For scanning these patients, appropriate PPEs must be worn. Now we need to protect ourselves and therefore we have to wear the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment and I've indicated which ones uh, we can wear. Now the patient should wear a face mask. That should not be negotiable. And again, because of the risk of the transmission of the infection, over prolonged periods and because of the risk, uh, the risk which is inherent as a result of the lack of social and physical distancing, it's important that the most experienced sonographer be the one to do the scan so that it can be done quickly and the sonographer can actually pick up whatever needs to be picked up and the procedure can end. Now, after all this, the surfaces should be cleaned and disinfected. Now, this is the minimum composition of a set of PPEs for the manage, uh, management of the suspected or confirmed cases. So we said that for respiratory protection, the, there should be the FFRs. For eye protection, the patient should wear goggles. For body protection, ideally long-sleeved water-resistant gowns should be worn. And for hand protection, we should wear gloves. Now, in conclusion, I just want to say that all we've said so far involve the, um, the hierarchy of controls. And what we are trying to do in mitigating our risk for getting COVID-19 or transmitting it to our patients is to one, um, try to eliminate the hazard. Now, the hazard in this case is COVID-19, and we can't really eliminate the hazard. And therefore, for as I said, for our older folk, we get them to stay at home, so they avoid contact with the hazard. And for the second level, substitution, this is where we try to replace the hazard. Again, it's going to be difficult to replace the hazard, so therefore, we try to change our work processes by doing social distancing. But that is going to be difficult again in COVID and uh, while doing ultrasound. So substitution is also very difficult. But then if we can do the engineering controls, that would be very helpful. Now in, in doing the engineering controls, we isolate the, um, the hazard. And by doing that, we, we can isolate the hazard, which is COVID-19, by identifying our workers who may be positive and also by doing social distancing for our patients, especially whilst they are in the waiting area. And we can do this by even putting markings, which would um, indicate where the limits of the patient's sitting, sitting positions should be. Now, we can institute administrative controls where we change the way our people would be working. Now we can do this by putting signposts and um, creating our uh, designing awareness creation programs. Of course, hand washing, uh, sanitizing, um, instruction and training programs so people will be more abreast with the measures that need to be put in place to prevent themselves and the patients from getting COVID-19. And these are things that are not very capital intensive. Now the final thing is the use of the personal protection equipment. So if you look at the, at the hierarchy, the least important happens to be our, uh, the use of the personal protective equipment. If you are able to do all the others, then it becomes easy to wear our personal, to use our personal protective equipment. And this should be done, the wearing of our personal protection equip, protective equipment should be done strictly. Now I would, end here and um, take questions if there are any. We do have one question, Dr. DeFortepoc, and you 
do you see it? Yes. Okay. So this is from Yannick. Yannick, and he says, mm -hmm. in, my, in my facility, I am the primary care physician, but I'm also the sonographer. Then I have to do many things or see many patients during the same day. Then how can I do to protect myself and my patients in this case? Thanks. Now, so in the case in such situations, I mean, in low resource settings, this seems to happen quite a lot. You may have one person who would end up doing a lot of the things that um, several people should have done. But because of the limitation in resources, you may have to um, double and do the duties other, other persons would have been required to do. Now, if this is a situation you find yourself in, then it is important that, again, you do the basic the basic things so like what everybody else should be doing hand washing in between patients because your patient contact will be you hope you have a lot of contact with your patients so hand washing in between contact with patients um social uh, or just a fiscal distancing so what some centers do is that they actually move their patient seat further away from the uh, provider so that the provider doesn't get too much in contact with the, I mean, too close to the patient. So if there are any aerosols or droplets that are being generated, at least you'll be further away from the patient. So you can actually do that by, I mean, when you're consulting, you'll be a bit far away from your patient. But when you are doing your ultrasound scan, for example, you would have to also go according to the protocols for prevention of transmission of infection between yourself and the patient. Now, if the ultrasound scan, the room in which you do an ultrasound scan is a small one, then ideally you shouldn't have too many people coming, in, coming into the room. And most of your patients who would be in line to have a scan done should be seated outside in an open area. And you'll just be seeing them a little at a time. And as I mentioned earlier, to reduce the risk of transmission if you can use the disposable tissue, it would be very helpful. But of course, your patient should be in a mask and you should also be in the appropriate uh, masks. I hope I've answered your question. And do you have time for one more question? Yes. Um, how, how to, so this is from Sha how to prevent cross transmission amongst patients in waiting areas of an ultrasound center. Now, this is a bit difficult in places where you can't control certain arrangements. But if you actually want to reduce cross transmission amongst the patients, then it starts with the screening from the entry point where you would actually be picking up the patients who are likely to have the uh, the virus and of course so you'd have risk you'd have done your scheduling such that only those which need to be done urgently are the ones you are doing but then you would um, screen the patients and then pick up those who are suspicious for covid so that those ones are taken out of the mix and sent to a place where they can actually be seated and reassessed and reassessed now in your um, waiting area, you just have to make sure you have only a few uh, seats in the waiting area. So depending on the size of your waiting area, you have to make sure that whatever number of seats you, ha you have in there is such that the protocols for social and physical distancing are recognized. Now, patients are required to do some form of um, hand, wash, uh, hand hygiene when they are coming into your facility. So they wash their hands or they do their alcohol, alcohol rub and this should be mandatory so that they risk transmitting infection to themselves and of course to you the the provider they should make sure that they are wearing face masks so at least they are protecting themselves in in such a, a situation that should help and of course the linen using different linens for patients should be helpful if you have that's available. But then if you have a disposable linen, 
it will be very helpful to rather use a disposable linen so that the patients do not uh, have contact with each other indirectly. Okay. Well, thank you. I believe we're, um, we need to wrap up now. Uh, but on behalf of the AIUM, our thanks to all of you who have participated in this webinar today. Thank you, Dr. Dufour de Pas, for your time and expertise. And I'd like to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. We hope you'll join us for future webinars and take care, everybody.